night, we were posing to do a little interactive discussion between all the members. And I have a little slideshow to kind of guide it. And I believe that uh, Charles will be a major contributor to all of the discussion here. And it's going to be about uh, how to choose a Macintosh computer. So let me just uh, share this little slideshow. So it's going to be about which Mac do I want? Laptop, desktop, iMac, or uh, studio? Now, as I said, we want this to be an interactive discussion. If it gets a little too lively on some topics, we'll ask to move on. But uh, we do want to hear uh, input from the members about what their opinions are and feelings are about the different uh, alternatives. And uh, <laughs> of course, you know, uh, don't press us on anything because we're perfectly willing to back off and say, no, I didn't really mean that. And uh, I'm going to copy that slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so we don't know you people, we don't know why we're here. Yep. Uh, I was never here, you never saw me. Uh, okay, so what are some basic rules? Well, one certainly is it's time to move to the M chip, the M series chips. And, uh, you know, you simply don't want to buy an Intel based Mac uh, that's going to be in the past. Support's going to dwindle away. All the really good stuff is going to be running on the M series. So definitely, you know, move forward. Next, uh, this has been a bit of conventional wisdom for a very long time. Uh, computers of any type always run better with the most random access memory that you can have. Now, so, so basically, you know, whatever you can afford, it really is not a bad idea to get it. Now with the M series, because uh, the random access memory is integrated with the system on the chip, uh, there's no aftermarket upgrade. So it's a good idea to really think about it and, and get as much as you can. Uh, and second, and the third one actually, uh, concerned storage. And uh, <clears throat> you, know, you can attach storage externally to your computer. That's what I do. I generally run a couple terabytes uh, in the uh, uh, computer uh, box itself, like in the laptop or the desktop. But then my main storage is uh, by a number of the disks that I, I uh, connect up with uh, USB-C. And uh, that's a good strategy. But nonetheless, you'll find that your system, uh, which uh, will be running off the uh, integral disk, will work best if you give it enough room. So, you know, I think one terabyte, two terabytes, if you feel the need, is a good idea there. Uh, Charles, do you have any alternatives to that? Yeah. Looking at the difference between RAM and storage, your better bet is to go with more storage uh, if you have to make a choice between them. Uh, if you get more RAM, that's really going to make its difference as far as the speed you see. Um, if you get enough apps or if you get big enough apps in the future, you can feel your machine slow down a bit um, as you. Um, use more stuff, but it's not actually going to suffer any uh, significant problems on that. On the storage, though, if you don't have enough storage, you will feel it harshly. Um, the system is going to slow down dramatically, and in some cases is going to refuse to work at all. Um, the system tends to actually complain to you bitterly before you reach that point. Uh, so then you know it's a time to start releasing some files and other such materials. Um, so as long as you're willing to spend the money, and you can spend a lot of money on the storage in these things, because I think at the top level, some of the pros actually have eight terabytes of SSD in them, and you'll spend over $2,000 to get it. You will need to find the balance on that. You know, it's kind of amusing because uh, back in September of 1969, I wrote my first program in Fortran for a big Burroughs mainframe. And the workspace on it was 52K bytes. Okay. And at the time, 
that was storage unending. You know, it was it was the best you could do. Um, and now we casually say, oh, go with a terabyte, couple terabytes, you know, whatever you can do. Uh, so yes, things are very different these days. Yeah. Also be aware that storage is suffering these Fibber McGee problem. Um, you will automatically expand to fill the space you have available. <laughs> I like to say that. Uh, can I ask a question? Do you guys want questions as we're going along? Or you want to wait till? Yeah, sure. Here? Go ahead. Please okay. do. So Robert, um, you, you're you running an M-based Mac, correct? Well, the laptop at the moment, yes. The laptop, okay. And are you using external storage on that? Uh, yeah, actually I do, but just for the video projects. Just for video uh, and projects. And also for uh, the... Uh, uh, the time machine backup that actually is the the video projects is actually a perfect um thing i guess my question is what do you notice in terms of the speed difference or or is or do you notice a speed difference if you're saving something let's say to the external over USB C as opposed to your internal on the on the machine itself quite honestly i've never benchmarked it okay i'm sure there is you know, a, a significant difference but, uh, it has not been an, a a criteria for me in deciding whether to go with the external storage or not okay but you haven't noticed anything it sounds like well, if you you've know, done I, it both ways and nothing has jumped out at you yeah i i you know i'm the kind of guy that doesn't notice the difference between winter and summer you know uh, so, <laughs> okay all right okay <laughs> you know, yeah, like, that's what sort of happened you know and, uh, so but uh uh, you know, I'm sure there, there is probably some sort of a throughput difference, but uh, the fact is I've always done video on external drives. Oh, you know, the, the video projects are so massive right. that I, I would, would not put them onto my internal drive and take up all that uh, precious space there. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's Thank not you. uncommon to see video projects that can easily go over a gigabyte in size per file. Mm-hmm. So you can eat up your storage pretty quickly doing that. Um, so getting into the external drives on that, though, throughputs and the like is a topic I would love to cover as a supplemental afterwards, maybe in the Q&A section. Mm -hmm. So we'll get back to that. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, we can. Okay, now, I'm not seriously expecting anyone to read the spreadsheet, uh, although if anyone wants it, I'll send it to them. And you know, Charles has made some inputs here and everything. But this just basically shows you all the combinations of uh, chips and RAM and storage and so forth between the laptops, the desktops, and, and uh, Mac Studio. And uh, we'll touch on this as we go through the different machines uh, a little bit later. Okay, just wanted to mention. Uh, I, this may be familiar to you all, but just to take care of some of the acronyms, you know, you have the central processing unit, the graphics processing unit, the random access memory, and the Apple uh, neural engine. All of these are integral on the M series chips. Previously, you had entirely separate uh, components for this. You would have had the CPU chip, you would have had a graphics card, you would have had uh, chips uh, separate for the random access memory, okay? You didn't even have the Apple Neural Engine. Um, but since these are all integral on the M chip, you basically make the decision when you order the machine of what you want. And then you're basically, that's going to be it. Okay. Uh, any comments? Yeah, so what is an Apple Neural Engine besides a clever marketing phrase? It's, it's really something. This enables a more efficient machine learning uh, capability in the, uh, in the computer. And uh, this is used by such things as your local Siri. It is also used by Final Cut Pro. Uh, and I believe there are a number of other apps, but uh, I don't know them offhand. Maybe, maybe Charles does. But it is uh, something that is useful for machine learning. 
think of it in some ways as uh, Max Artificial Intelligence Center um, doing neural network ta tasks, such as a prime one is in your photos library. It actually scans your library, and if you actually have a few marked things, like, oh, yes, okay, like this is John, or this is Kenji, or this is Robert, you know, by faces, it will look through the rest of your photo library and say, this looks like Robert. Is this Robert? If so, I'll mark it as such. Um, and it actually is, with the neural engine, pretty speedy in doing so. Uh, there are examples of that that just go through the entire system. The advantage of having that is there's a lot of that sort of like deep learning customization stuff that's happening local on your machine and never leaves your machine. So it's kind of your own private artificial intelligence center. Retina, liquid retina and XDR. Well, the retina display, as you've known for some years now, basically means that at normal viewing, you cannot perceive the pixels. It looks all nice and smooth. And it really does. You know, we, we had complaints from people that said, no, I can get my face within two inches, I can see the pixels. <laughs> uh, you know, well, fine. But the idea is if you're at a normal viewing distance, uh, uh, it is a, a, a nice continuous looking picture. Liquid retina display, uh, they increase the number of backlighting LEDs. I think the retina display had one and the liquid retina has four or something like that, four quadrants. Uh, and basically to distinguish it, well, the marketing guy said, let's call it liquid, okay? And uh, there's some confusion over that, but that, that's all it really means. Then you have the super liquid retina display, which uses organic LED technology. And I've forgotten the number, but it has a, uh, a much larger number of backlighting uh, uh, LED panels uh, on it. And uh, it supposedly gives you a much more consistent uh, uh, across the screen uh, uh, display, with the same contrast, the same brightness levels and so forth. And uh, again, the marketing guy said to sit down and say, what are we going to call this? And after lots of brainstorming, they came up with super. Um, you know, that, that's, uh, I threw that in there because in my old corporate life, uh, early on, I actually, as, as a technical, I had to sit in on such marketing meetings and uh, listen to them kick around potential uh, names for brands. Uh, then after that, we have the extended dynamic range uh, display uh, that is an improved contrast. It uh, 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 shows more details in the shadows, more details in highlights than uh, the other displays. Also, that uh, the extended dynamic range displays tend to be your uh, 4K and 5K uh, type displays. Uh, yeah. Any comments? Yeah. XDR, yeah. Is, oh. XDR is the only term of those that you listed, that's not an Apple proprietary term. That's correct. Yeah, extended dynamic range, you're talking uh, like the high dynamic range sort of stuff that you hear often applied to photographs and the like. So yeah, better contrast. Is that also relevant to the wider color spaces? I think so, yeah. I think that gets into, uh, what is it called? the. Uh, is it Apple P3 or something like that uh, color space uh, yeah. that uh, is much larger than uh, uh, Profoto. And of course that's even much larger than Adobe. And it, it makes the standard sRGB uh, uh, just seem very limited. Um, yeah, cases where for, uh, particularly for things like load, photographs of flowers and the like that have more intense reds and uh, in some cases for us in colors, they actually show up better on your display than otherwise. Uh, phones and iPads have had this for a while and Macs, I believe at this point now have all of the laptops using that. I'm not entirely sure about the, the low end ones like the MacBook Air. Yeah, but I think anything that's, that's up there will definitely have that. Um, 
Now bear in mind that means there'll be a lot of colors being shown that uh, us of the male persuasion may not be able to see what the females can. Um, and that's actually not a joke, that's a, a, a actual uh, neurophysiological uh, phenomenon. Um, I have a slideshow on uh, color spaces that maybe I'll show sometime. Okay, any other things about the displays before we move on? Let's just talk quickly about our criteria that uh, you would use to choose between your machines. Uh, you know, application, that's kind of obvious. If you're doing something that is just uh, surfing the web and using Microsoft Office, your requirements really aren't all that large. You know, you might be able to make do with a, a simpler, cheaper machine. But if you're doing things like uh, trying to uh, render animations in Autodesk Maya or using Final Cut Pro or uh, Adobe Audition, some very high-end applications of that nature, uh, then you have to think about uh, what am I going to be able to afford, what I have to move to for that. After that, I would say comes mobility. You know, Am I going to be happy sitting at home at my desk doing my work? Or am I the kind of person that is on the road I'm meeting clients, I'm uh, you know, traveling to visit relatives, whatever, am I going to need mobility? Uh, cost, of course, because there's a very wide range of, uh, of cost involved. Uh, Charles uh, mentioned ports, uh, you know, because if you look at the super machines, they will have, some I think in some cases, just two USB ports. And uh, you really have to move up to the higher machines to get the Thunderbolt ports uh, in uh, larger combinations. Also, Ethernet and uh, oh, uh, things like SD card slots and HDMI out for uh, driving uh, HDMI displays. Then you got to think about how long you're going to use this computer. Um, you know, back in the day, people used to say you replace your PC every three years and your Macintosh every five. Uh, but we're seeing a rather rapid evolution of uh, the uh, technology used in computers. And uh, if you're using it seriously for uh, work or commercial purposes, you may find yourself having to uh, trade up more often. Uh, comments? If you're going to be doing some amount of future proofing, it's a good idea to know just how much future you actually expect uh, for that purpose. So using storage as an example on that, you may look at the thing and say, oh yeah, I'm only using like, like one or potentially two terabytes of storage space now, but I'd better get a four because I may need that in the future. Well, sure, but if you're only going to be using it for about four or five years, you may not actually reach that point in that time frame, And so a better bet might be to wait until the next machine you get after this one um, to get that larger space. Okay, any other uh, comments? I have a question if I may. It's about the music capability. There's comments from Apple about the sound systems in the in the MacBook Pro at least. Is that something that you would consider in uh, making a decision about buying, let's say, a MacBook Pro versus the studio? Well, I'm not an audio guy. Um, you know, um, things like GarageBand work perfectly fine, even on the entry-level Macs. But if you want to use things like Logic Pro, you know, that takes a little more oomph to really get the uh, features out of it, especially when you add a lot of inputs for multiple instruments and sources. And the same goes for Adobe Audition. And uh, I don't know what other high-end audio apps are out there, but uh, it, that's probably the situation for those. You very swiftly start running into cases where if you're going to be worrying about audio, the chances are pretty high that you're going to end up buying an external audio speaker set or headphones of some sort that'll bypass all of that. Well, I, I was thinking more in terms of processing capability because well, I'm doing multiple MIDI inputs and 
that kind of thing, then I'll need something that can keep up with it. It's good to hear about both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That said, um, I do have an M1 Pro, uh, MacBook Pro, and the audio is considerably better on it than previous MacBooks. And when I go back and use my older ones, it, they sound very tinny. So even though it may not be a, a good reason to buy one, it is a benefit. Uh, they have better uh, audio, qual audio quality on the lower end. Okay, good, yeah. That's good to know, thank you. Yeah. It really never comes into a case where audio is going to, at least like this, the sound output is going to be a primary item for your like purchase decision. Um, I can't see somebody, for instance, buying a MacBook Pro because it offers a better speaker set than the regular MacBook does. Um, but it is worth looking into. And keep in mind that if you're one of those sort of people who actually uses, say, AirPods uh, in Bluetooth, um, you're never going to really use the speakers on the laptop anyway. Um, but even so, as an example on that thing, I just made a switch from an iPad Pro to an iPad Air, which only has speakers on one side. And so far, I really haven't noticed a difference in audio quality between the two. Okay. By the way, I have my laptop uh, feeding a uh, studio display at the moment. And I'm using the speakers on it, and you know, I think they are significantly better. So, okay. Uh, so Thank you. On. Okay. So now we're going to just run through some specific computers. Going to throw out an idea of what they might be used for, and you can give us some feedback on uh, what your thoughts are on it. So let's take a look first at the MacBook Air. Well, obviously it's the most affordable machine and it is very lightweight, very mobile. Uh, and I consider it good for web surfing and for basic office, uh, and, you know, and th those would be the use cases for it. It's uh, probably a good classroom computer if you uh, have someone who's going to college and they need something to uh, take to classes, this would be it. Uh, so what do you think? Is that a good assessment? Yeah. I know people out there who actually will gravitate to a MacBook Air specifically because it is the lightest and in some cases, smallest one of the bunch. They're not concerned so much with getting, say, more screen space, which the higher end models will get you. But they find that having a machine that's half the weight is the most valuable feature of all because they can carry it everywhere they go without any extra fatigue um i actually was uh had similar uh you know issues with that back in the day it's when the macbooks when the macbook airs first came out um my macbook pro committed seppuku and um it said well here's an air use this instead and it's like, oh, but it's underpowered. I don't want to think. And I very, very quickly fell in love with just how light and portable it was being able to go from one office to the next with no troubles. So that think, very well became an important feature on the things. Another thing to think about is that the MacBook Air actually has some competition from the iPad Pro, especially when you. Uh, attach one of the folding keyboards to it. Um, and for many use cases, that may be uh, actually a preferable uh, uh, setup. So next we look at the uh, MacBook Pro uh, 13 inch. Now, uh, Charles can correct me on this, but I'm pretty sure the major difference between uh, the 13 inch Mac Pro and the uh, Air is the active cooling. And when you add the active cooling uh, to the M1 chip, you could run it at higher power and hence higher speed. So uh, uh, that gives you uh, a bump up in performance. And uh, from what I've read, it sounds like it would be good for a lot of uh, things such as photo editing, maybe video editing and so forth. Um, you know, so I think it, it kind of fits into that slot. Uh, 
Uh, it's still reasonably small, reasonably portable. Uh, any yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Because of the fan, you get a slight boost on that if you're pushing it hard. But other than that, the performance is about the same between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it does come with a little larger battery also. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. It'll be uh, disc options the same on the two? Yeah. Okay. All right, then we get into the 14 inch and the 16 inch. And uh, we get a big price jump. I mean, these are double the cost of the MacBook Air. Uh, but at this point, uh, you know, you're getting into significant performance. And you can do things like Final Cut Pro or Edition and uh, other high end applications. It does have the better display. And that can be important if you're. Uh, making presentations to people and want them to have a, a good image. Um, you know, so if you're willing to get into, uh, uh, let's see, I believe this is the uh, 1500 to $2,000 range. Uh, you're looking at a machine here that is roughly doubling the capabilities. It's got twice the CPU, twice the RAM possible, twice the storage possible, twice the ports in some cases, and twice the cost. Yeah. So yeah, it basically is, uh, is you know, a judgment between your cost versus performance. May I ask about the screen size? Is there a big advantage for someone whose eyesight is perhaps not perfect to have a 16 inch screen versus say the the size of a screen on the air. Hmm. It can make a difference. Um, if you get enough advantage out of that, you can set any of these laptops to actually have a lower resolution um, on the screen you have. So the text or, or make the text larger in some cases so that you can actually be able to see things on an easier measure. Every time Apple puts one of these out, things out, it seems to take, add just a few more pixels in and the text gets a little bit smaller, you know, with each generation. So yes, that may be one mitigation, but that's going to come into play most when you're dealing with a, in a portable environment, when you're out on the go with the thing. Mm -hmm. One of the big assumptions is if you're working at home, you're probably going to connect the larger display and use that instead, which, you know, again, bypasses the issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, but yeah. that also gets into much heavier issues as well, because then you have to choose what kind of display you want uh, on an external. And we'll talk more about that on the desktops. Okay. Well, another thing to note about the screen size on the MacBook Pro 14. Physically, the MacBook Pro 14 is the same physical size very closely to the to prior MacBook Pro 13 inches. They just don't have much of a bezel on the screen, so there's a lot more area to see, and it does help the visibility. I mean, marginally over a 13 inch, but it's always better to have more space. Um, of screen space without actually making the computer physically very much bigger. So the 14s in terms of portability is about the same as the MacBook Pro 13. Uh, the 16 is another story though. That is a seriously big computer for a laptop. Uh, Linda, you have some? Yeah, I do. Thank if, you. if I were in this position of being unsure as to whether I wanted the 14 or the 16, and my concern was visual, what I can see on the screen, I think I would go to the store and pull up a screen where I could physically make that comparison. Because uh, our, our, you know, what we perceive is so individual. And I might be working with an app that somebody else might not, et cetera, et cetera. But, but go to the store and, and make the actual comparison to see if the screen size between those two make a difference for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about the desktops. And our first desktop is the Mac Mini. Uh, now, 
that's affordable and it uh, and is a very powerful thing. It's an M1 chip. Uh, you can choose a third party display. Uh, people often complain about the fact that while the Apple displays are nice, you know, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, have good performance, you can do a lot better in terms of price to performance ratio by going with third party display. You know, you can go out there and you can get a, a 4K display for just a, a couple hundred dollars in some places. Um, you know, so you have that option. You can go with a, a different display. You can also do the same in terms of uh, keyboard and mouse. You know, some people will be out there and say, well, I want a real gaming keyboard. And Apple doesn't have that. Uh, you know, and, and that's available when you uh, uh, do a component-based system like the Mac Mini. Um, and let's see, I don't have my spreadsheet up at the moment, but um, what are the options for the Mac Mini? Uh, Charles, do you remember? As far as the CPU or other criteria? Well, when you uh, change the CPU, what happens to your ports? I believe- No change. No change, okay. Mm -hmm. No. You get the same things, and that can be an issue on the things. The ports are fairly limited on the mini. You get two USB A size for taking your more traditional hard drives and SSD cards. You get uh, two USB C ports and an HDMI and an Ethernet, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So, if you've got a whole bunch of things that are strewn across your desk, you're likely going to need to have a USB hub of some sort to give you some more ports to work with. Um, and again, one of the things that you're dealing with is, is it's a desktop machine and it's a simple desktop machine. So you're probably going to be doing simple things with it. The screens that you attach are not going to be as good as the screens on the laptops. But at the same time, they can also be a lot larger. I have friends who have actually taken their M1 Mac minis and attached a 36 inch double wide display to their machine for gaming purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not retina. Mm -hmm. So there's going to always be trade offs there. Yeah. I got to tell you, the, the gamers are crazy people. <laughs> 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 and the likelihood is the serious gamers aren't going to be reaching for a Mac anyway. No, they, they build their own machine with uh, water-cooled CPUs and everything. Uh, Linda, you had something else? I was just, if, you, if you're using um, a mini and with a USB hub, et cetera, et cetera, how much of a disadvantage is that in terms of performance? I, I know that's an impossible question to... Well, the answer, I guess it depends on what you're doing, but is, again, I'm just wondering about slowdown. It's similar to the question I was asking Robert earlier about, um, you know, ac external storage. Does that make sense, Charles? Mm. It just ought to be fast enough and not worry about it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what I'm, that's what yeah. I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, because it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because differences in speed on that mark with a Mac Mini, you're looking at about the same really as to what the MacBook Pro offers um, on its lower end, because uh, it's the same chip running at the same speeds with the same environment. Um, so you're going to get roughly the same performance out of that. But the USB, um, if you're, yeah, if you're using a hub. Is that going to make it? I mean, how much difference does it make that you don't have the ports in the machine? Is what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, that largely depends on how much you're actually doing with the ports. Um, this is a question uh, I know that Jenny was asking this um, on the SV mail list today, and it's the subject I'm hoping to get into more afterward. Okay. Um, because if you're using, say, just some incidental sort of stuff, you'll probably never notice a difference on that mark. Uh, but if you're going to be using a lot of those simultaneously, um, a hub can be a bottleneck. You have to use a hub. <laughs> You've got to get <laughs> you got to get your camera in someplace. 
you got to get this in, you got to get that in, and uh, you got to get your um, uh, storage in. And you, you know, you run out, so you have to buy something, but you know, it does, it's not that expensive. I'm more thinking about if I were just deciding between a studio and a mini, because the studio has more ports. So what what am I gaining or losing if I go one way or the other? More, you know, by having to have because if it's you've got more ports on the physical machine, then you don't need necessarily to use a hub. Yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. So by the time you choose um, more RAM and more storage in a mini, you're getting close to the price of a studio, which in its base configuration has 32 gigabytes of RAM. So it seems to me kind of a no brainer to go with the studio. And also I am finding that like right now, Zoom is running. If I was on my old mini, the fan would be cranking away, cooling it because Zoom is fairly processor intensive. The studio is silent. Um, I, it's, the fan is running, I can stick my hand behind it and feel air movement through the huge, through the huge venting, vents in the back. But the only time I've really heard my fan crank up is when I ran the, what is it called? Not, not Mac hardware test, the current one. And, um, and at one point it intentionally cranks up the fans to full blast. And then it sounds something like a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter winding up. <laughs> Although to be fair, you're going to find that true across um, all of the M1 systems on the things. I mean, that's the great beauty of the newer chips is that, uh, you know, they are going to just sit there cool and clean on your desk uh, or in your lap. Um, far better than your older equipment does. Hmm. And that'll be true from the MacBook uh, Air all the way up to the top. Linda, to your question about the differences between the ports on the two systems, the mini and the studio. And Charles, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think there's a lot more bandwidth available on the ports on the studio. So you could probably run a lot more multi, multiple monitors with a lot higher resolution, say, or then you will be able to do on the mini. Uh, does that true. make sense to you, Charles? Yeah, that's true. Um, a lot of that has to do with the capabilities of the chip on the inside of the things. Um, right. And um, I mean, some of the some of the things that are important here. This is a bit of a side topic. The M1 comes in four flavors that you're dealing with. And the M1, the M1 Pro, the M1 Max, and the M1 Ultra. And you're roughly doubling the capabilities at, on each step that you go. So that includes a lot of the things like how many screens you can attach, how much RAM you have available, um, and a lot of the thing on how many it's largely how many cores you also have available on that thing. All the cores across the M1 are the same from the lowest chip to the highest chip. It's just a question of how many you're getting inside that package. What do you mean by that? Meaning that you've got the M, the basic M1 chip that comes with like eight cores or 10 cores on something. Um, the M1 Pro has say 16 cores. The M1 Max has 32 cores, and the M1 Ultra has 64 cores, that kind of operation. Uh, but each core is capable of the same amount of work, you know, whether you've got the Ultra or the lowest end uh, M1. So a lot of that is going to depend on your applications um, and how much they make use of the parallel processing sort of stuff. Graphics applications do wonderfully with that. Other items, it will vary from app to app. Um, you know, for instance, if you were actually working something like a spreadsheet or mathematical calculations of that sort, they're probably not going to see that much boost uh, having more cores. 
Another thing I forgot, you have to have something to get between your your keyboard and your mouse. So that takes up another USB port. Hmm. Unless you have a wired keyboard that has a couple of USB ports on it. Yeah, well, anyhow, and then, you know, you got to get to your camera and you have to get to, you want a charging cable for your phone. <laughs> yeah. You that know. gets into convenience on that sort of thing. You know, yeah. the general notion of the thing is, I'm sorry, I only have like three ports. I'm going to have to unplug one thing to replug another. Yeah, but if yeah. you feel it's worthwhile to have enough ports to plug stuff in and leave it plugged in, then that's a criteria. Sure. And we were having trouble getting to the printer wirelessly. So I found a printer cable. So now I can go right. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move so, on. Then. So um, are the different um, USB ports in, say, a Mac Studio, um, maybe I'm jumping in. Um, actually on separate buses so if i have a usb 2 device connected to a hub connected no. to one of them would drag down more than that one port yeah let's hold on that till we reach the studio okay okay so imac 24 inch and this of course is your all-in-one it's you know pricey but not you know phenomenally pricey. I put it between the MacBook Air and the uh, MacBook Pro that's similarly configured. And uh, what I basically think about it is if you're content to be working at a desktop, you don't need mobility, this is what you would want instead of the MacBook Pro. Um, you know, so what do you think? Yeah. This is again another of those machines that is equal in performance to the Mac Mini or the MacBook Air, or for that matter, the MacBook Pro, because it's got the same, pretty much the same hardware on the inside, and roughly the same ports too. Uh, the advantage that it has is that it has the all-in-one design with the screen built into the thing, so you've got just a single piece that sits on your desktop, you know, plus your keyboard and mouse. Um, so if you don't, yeah, so if you just want to have a, a straightforward, simple setup or for your desktop at home, um, this is the common approach on that. But as desktop displays go today, that's not a whole lot of, um, that's not a whole lot of screen real estate. 24 inches. It actually is uh, equal, if not slightly better, as far as pixels to what the uh, 27 inches were giving under Intel. Oh, sorry, I need to correct on that. Um, the 24 inch is definitely more screen real estate than a 21 inch, but it is slightly less than the 27 uh, in terms of pixels, not just uh, uh, number of inches. I'm wondering, Linda, would you be happy with the 24 inch iMac? No, I have decided that that's not what I want. So I, I'm, I'm, so I'm figuring out where to go from there. I'm not going to do the 27. I've looked at them; they're pretty, and I do like the colors. But that's not what I want. I want, I want, I, what I wanted was the 27, and uh, yeah. So I'm still, still looking to see what I want to do. Yeah. So you end up in that case looking at the external displays as your alternatives on that with a mini or for that matter with the laptop um, offering you a studio yeah offering you uh, um, like uh, the the lower um, the, the standard resolution sort of stuff for a much lower cost for the display um, or a 27 inch say retina display from LG um instead or the studio display or a or, or a studio display if you want to have uncompromising uh um uh, high-end display tech yeah so what? i see that like on the costco website right now they have an an lg 48 inch i think it is 4k monitor that's around three hundred and seventy-five dollars. That's a TV. It's not a monitor. A TV. I'm wondering at 
the same distance, like arm's length from the screen that I have these screens on my desktop. What would a four a four K monitor a TV as a monitor say three feet from my eyes be like as far as pixel resolution and quality? Would it be would it work or would it be bad? It probably would work. Um, I'm not. You know, you'd have to do extra measurements on uh, like frame rates on the like. Um, cause I don't think that the Mac can drive them at those really high frame rates. Um, so that may be a deciding factor, but as far as the, the pictures, you were looking at something with 4,000 pixels across versus, oh, say the 24 inch IMAX display, which is, uh, what, 2,500 pixels across. So. That's assuming, of course, that you don't just set the thing to high definition, which is only 2,000 pixels across. So more trade-offs, more balancing, and more stuff you need to compare. Yeah. I will say that uh, you'll probably find that it will not be as vibrant and uh, have as much dynamic range as uh, uh, the uh, Apple Studio display. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, it simply isn't designed that way. Um, you know, it's designed for a mass market. Uh, but yeah, there's no reason that uh, you can't use any HDMI input uh, 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 television as a perfectly good tr uh, terminal display. Yeah. Okay. Well, our next one is the Mac Studio. And that's almost like it should be sold in a whole different store um, than the others. Um, and the way I phrased it is that if you know you need a Mac Studio, then you probably need it. If you don't know that you need it, then likely you don't actually need it. You know, it's that kind of thing. You're either uh, pushing capabilities right now and you say, well, I need to go with the studio. If you're not pushing the capabilities, you might be, uh, you know, wasting your money to go with it. Um, also, when I look at the configurations, and I start saying, "Well, do I want the 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 Pro, the Max, or the Ultra?" The answer almost always comes up: the Ultra. And uh, uh, you know, with as much memory as it's got and everything else, so that means that you very quickly get into the the very pricey. Uh, uh, echelon of this particular computer. But all the preliminary reports that I've read on it uh, basically say that in their benchmarks, it's just crazy fast, and gets crazy performance. This is the machine you typically would grab a hold of if you're actually doing work you get paid for. Um, because in that case, how much work you can do is directly proportional to how much you get paid. So and you want the best you can get. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, you figure on that sort of thing, if what you're looking for is something that actually offers a heavy amount of uh, um, ports, uh, which this thing does, it actually has the most ports of anything I think Apple's put out in the last four years, except for the, the cheese grater tower. Hmm. Um, you know, you're still going to be charging a minimum of $2,000 on that. And you can very easily bump that over 3000 once you add extra memory and storage on the inside of it. Um, and then of course, if you go for the high end, like the M1 ultra chip, well, now you're looking at four to $6,000 for the same, um, same kind of setup. You know, if you're a professional, that's what you want. Uh, but if you're more casual, it's probably overkill. Yeah, I'll tell you what I've seen. I've, I've seen people that have been able to do uh, eight streams of 4K video uh, with rendering of titles and that kind of thing without any glitches, just running straight up. Uh, they're able to uh, run multiple uh, 4K monitors. Um, 
you know, it, it, it does give a lot of performance. And in the older configuration, you've got the, I believe, four Thunderbolts on the back and two Thunderbolts on the front. You also get the uh, card slot and you got Ethernet. Um, you know, so, um, uh, oh yeah, not to mention the headphone jack. Um, okay. Because uh, that, that's a make or break consideration for a lot of people, that headphone jack. Um, but uh, yes, you know, I mean, this is the machine to go with if uh, you either have a lot of disposable income or you have a tax write off. So, you know. If I were to use a car analogy, it would be kind of like buying a McLaren F1 um, when you're taking trips around the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> Not quite as bad as, uh, say, I have a sports car to go to the grocery store, but, uh, um, mm. you know, because you will certainly enjoy the process, but you're going to spend a lot more money doing it. So uh, questions that, uh, Kanji, you were asking about uh, some of the ports on this thing? Yes. The ports that you get, I mean, one of the great advantages here is that it actually does have the, the the studio does have double the number of ports as the Mac Mini, largely because the chip that's inside the 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 M1 Max and the M1 Ultra can actually support that the way that the lower end chips cannot. You know, but even so, you you see some of the differences on there. They mentioned that. Um, it has four Thunderbolt ports on the back of the Ultra, and there's two ports on the front. But if you get the M1 Max, they're USB ports. If you get the M1 Ultra, they're Thunderbolt ports. And that's directly uh, because of the uh, CPU inside the thing and what it's capable of. So as far as price goes, I'm looking right now at the Apple website and a Mac Mini with the bigger amount of RAM, which is 16 is the max you can get. And a one terabyte SSD um, is $1,300. The Mac Studio with 32 gigs and one terabyte is 2000. So that's not that much money between them that I would, that I really, I don't know that I'd say it's like buying a Maserati. It's, um, it might just be buying for the future. Yeah, that could very well be buying for the future. That is definitely buying for the extra ports. <laughs> um, plus, of course, you also get a chip that's, um, what, four times more powerful than what you get in uh, in that mini. And another aspect on all of this that um, we haven't really brought up quite so much in the thing was, is the question, okay, so you wanna buy a Mac, how long do you wait? If you read, say, German's article from earlier in the week saying, here's what's coming as far as all of these different machines and the things, how much do you trust that and how many months are you willing to hold off on your purchases and work with your current old stuff until that comes or rumors change on that sort of thing you know well, that's I got, I got tired always going of waiting. to be a worthy thing if you spend your time because you can actually spend a whole bunch of time if you spend a whole bunch of time saying i'll wait for the next thing because it's better well, at some point, you're going to have to make a decision or you'll never buy a new piece of equipment. I spent a long time waiting for the second version of the Mac, of the M1 Mac Mini. And when in March, it still wasn't coming. That's where I kind of went, okay, this is my Mac Mini on steroids. Yeah. Yeah, German's piece mentioned... Um, a Mac mini with an M2 in the works. And there's no notion as to what it's actually going to have. You know, presumably it'll be faster, but do we know anything more beyond that? 
So what about external SSD storage on a Mac Studio as far as the speed of, say, Thunderbolt compared to the, inter an inter the internal SSD or, the, or Thunderbolt compared to USB 3.1 version 2, I th or Gen 2, I think it's called, or USB 3.2, which I don't think the Mac Studio has, or USB 4, which it says it does have, but I don't think there are actually any USB 4 peripherals yet. Am I right on any of that? Um, USB 3.2, it looks like, is not on any of the current machines as such. USB 4 is basically um, the next step after that. So it's a, anything that has USB 4 is going to have 3.2, you know, just by nature on that. Um, hang on, I'm looking over the specs that, I, that are on the screen as, as we talk on the things. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So there's USB 4 on the USB C plugs, uh, the little things that shares that with a Thunderbolt. Um, but it only does USB 3.1 on the USB A ports, which are the old style. So, and there's where you get your difference on things. So it's, it gets to be one of those questions of pushing the speeds. You see the speeds listed there, for example, saying, um, USB A will do like five to 10 gigabits a second. USB 4 will do up to 40 gigabits a second. Thunderbolt will do 20 to 40 gigabits a second. Now compare that with your solid state drives that at the high end SSDs these days are gonna be running about three gigabits per second uh, top speed. So, a lot of that is going to be, if you want to get into those higher speeds, you're going to need to get a device that's actually built for such speed. Uh, raid boxes and, and you know, like fiber things and similar higher end items on that. Um, USB 4 is a kind of a nice idea on the things, but I've really not seen any of them in the market yet. Um, I'm figuring it's probably going to be another year before they really hit mainstream. For right now, USB 3 versus Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt still wins. But USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4 are matched. In fact, they're largely the same thing. Things are just going to get a lot fuzzier and more complicated. So I see Linda's gears turning, and so are mine, around an, an external SSD, say an NVMe, is it called? Um, external SSD connected externally, is that going to be comparable speed to the internal SSD? If it's running on Thunderbolt, definitely. Uh, if it's running on USB, you're going to be seeing a slight uh, bump, slight bump down in speed because of USB's overhead. Um, and the more that it has to share that connection with other USB devices, the more overall things are going to slow down. So, yes, you can very easily get a, an external Thunderbolt drive that'll match what your internal SSD can do. Are we using the same ports for connectivity for the Thunderbolt and the USB? Yes. Okay. So, even if they, they change or go, Virtually the Thunderbolt and the USB are going to be interchangeable as far as connectivity. Is that what I'm kind of hearing? Uh, that's the notion, yeah. Right. Uh, the only real difference on that is, um, the, is the two ports on the front of the studio um, that are USB only on the, um, on the lower end model and um, are full Thunderbolt ports that support everything on the higher end model. I see. Hmm. So the computer senses whether it's a Thunderbolt um, device or a USB device connected to the USB-C ports. And it'll take the best that it can uh, negotiate, yes. 
Okay, well, I think we're at a point where we should start wrapping up. Um, yeah. more have we answered all the questions? Does anybody have anything else to uh, ask or comment on that? I have some comments. This has been really helpful for me to, I, I have a Mac Studio on order as of today. And after listening to this whole discussion, you've made me very confident that I've made the right choice for me. It's definitely overkill of a machine, but I wanted to future proof my setup and not have to do this again for the next 10 years. And I really want those extra ports because I have my computer set inside a piece of furniture. So it's really hard to get to the back to like put in a SD chip or something like that. Um, I did struggle with saving money and going with a different monitor, but I bit the bullet and also ordered the studio display. I've heard there are problems with the webcam. They're hoping to fix with software, which hasn't happened yet. But um, oh, I must have watched 20 hours of videos comparing the LG Superfine and the, the Dell and the studio display. And what it came down to for me was there were a lot of complaints about the other monitors. And that could certainly happen with the studio display but I like to be able to carry it into the Apple store and not have to deal with some third party or shipping it. So thank you so much for the details. Um, I really got a good education tonight and I, I feel so much more confident that I made the right choice for me.